Okay, we're going to start back up again. Um, so after that uh, initial sort of foray into the sort of technical background, most of the rest of these sessions will be about various particular crises or dangers in the nuclear space. Um, and we thought since you're going out to the uh, emergency management center this afternoon, that we would start off with the danger of nuclear and radiological terrorism. This is the sort of thing that, uh, for better or for worse, doesn't really make it to the headlines except that something awful actually happens. It's more a sort of ongoing problem in the background often. Uh, and so sometimes it's hard to really uh, get a lot of good reporting uh, on it. I had one reporter who said to me, my editor told me, I don't want another nuclear smuggling story unless you've got a smuggler with plutonium in his pocket. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's an important issue, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about it. Uh, so I'm going to try to skip through some material fairly quickly, if I can get this to work, which apparently I can't. Um, perhaps it's not on. That would be one best one. There we go. All right. So. Basically, there are three types of nuclear or radiological terrorism that uh, you might worry about. Uh, one is the actual use of nuclear explosives. Uh, and that's what I spend a lot of my time uh, on, actually, for the last quarter century or so. Uh, that would be really incredibly catastrophic. I'll talk more about that. It is, would be quite difficult for terrorists to accomplish. It would probably be the most challenging thing that any terrorist group could ever manage to pull off, but it isn't as implausible as some people think, unfortunately. Then there's sabotage of a major nuclear facility, like a nuclear power plant, a reprocessing plant, something like that. That could be quite catastrophic if the sabotage was really, really successful. It might have great limited impact otherwise. Um, uh, and then there's uh, what's sometimes referred to as a dirty bomb. Uh, where you just take some radioactive material that you might get from a hospital or something like that and just spread it over an area. And that probably wouldn't kill hardly anybody uh, other than perhaps the people killed by the explosive you used to, to disperse the material, but it would create a lot of panic. People, You'd have to evacuate uh, an area, um, and it could be quite disruptive and expensive, uh, and it's way easier to do. So in terms of likelihood, this is by far the most likely, uh, but in terms of really transforming the world in a serious way, an actual nuclear bomb going off in a city is uh, a much bigger issue. But all of these are real potential problems. Um, terrorist groups have pursued or considered or planned on each of these three uh, kinds of attacks over the years, and there are some plots that suggest there may be ongoing interest. One episode that uh, is fairly recent was uh, ISIS operatives who had been involved in the uh, Paris attacks uh, carrying out many hours of video monitoring of the home of a uh, Belgian uh, nuclear scientist who's one of the top guys at Belgium's main nuclear research facility, which there's a bunch of stuff at that facility. We don't know what the monitoring was about, but one of the things at that facility is a substantial chunk of uh, highly rich uranium. Uh, so it's at least plausible that what that monitoring was about was potentially uh, kidnapping family members to coerce him to do something related to that facility. A recent example, uh, in August of 2014, an insider at the Del 4 nuclear power plant in Belgium uh, sabotaged the facility, opened a locked valve, let all the coolant for the uh, uh, all the lubricant for the uh, turbine drain out. The turbine overheated and destroyed itself. Um, they started investigating, they still don't know who did it or why, but they started investigating and they thought, oh, now you, you, this isn't the guy who did it because he'd been gone for almost two years. But we had a guy who was cleared, had a, passed a background check to have access to the vital areas of the plant where the stuff that if you sabotaged it, it would be a big problem is, who went off to fight for terrorists in Syria <laughs> um, and was later convicted as part of a Belgian terrorist group. Um, <clears throat> So these are not just hypothetical worries. Uh, Al-Qaeda had a fairly focused nuclear weapons program, got as far as carrying out crude but sensible explosive tests in the Afghan uh, desert. 
for their nuclear program. Um, Shinrikyo, the Japanese terror cult that launched the nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subways, also had a significant nuclear effort. There isn't a lot of hard evidence of ISIS interest. There are these hints, but I don't see any evidence of a sustained program. And honestly, if, if there was classified evidence of a sustained program, you wouldn't see the Secretary of Defense saying, you know, the big problems are Russia and China and not terrorists. So. <laughs> um, uh, but there are multiple government studies that have concluded that if a sophisticated terrorist group actually got hold of highly enriched uranium or plutonium in sufficient purity and quanti quantity, it is plausible they could make a crude bomb. And unfortunately, there are a bunch of cases of seizure of real stolen highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Uh, also, a bunch of cases of actual or planned sabotage. There, Believe it or not, there was actually a case decades ago where an insider brought explosives into a nuclear power plant, put them right on the steel pressure vessel head, and detonated them. Uh, fortunately, that was not a plant that was yet operational. It wasn't intended to cause a radioactive release. It was intended to send a message. We, we can get to uh, you know, your most uh, strategic points. This was in South Africa many years ago. Uh, so, as I mentioned, with nuclear material, the terrorists might be able to make crude nuclear bombs. It really doesn't take a Manhattan project. It doesn't take, you know, hundreds of scientists and huge facilities and so on. Uh, the estimates from the, the studies that have been done are sort of, you know, a dozen to a couple of dozen people with the right skills and sort of the kinds of tools you would have in a typical machine shop. Uh, so uh, for making, again, a crude, unsafe, unreliable nuclear bomb. So unfortunately, it is plausible that terrorists would be able to do that. And one thing people don't realize is a lot of the key people involved in Al-Qaeda's nuclear program, while we have sort of done a lot to destroy the core of Al-Qaeda, the nuclear people are mostly still out there. We don't know where the heck they are. Um, Saif al Adel just got released from, he'd been under a very loose form of house arrest in Iran for many years, but he's now been released in a prisoner trade with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and there's this Pakistani nuclear expert. There was this episode in 2003 where they were working on buying three things that they thought were nuclear weapons. And they said, go ahead and make the purchase if the Pakistani nuclear expert confirms that they're real. And we still don't know who that was, that Al-Qaeda had such confidence in or what he's been doing for the last 15 years. Uh, and while many countries think that this is really only a threat to the United States or to a couple of other countries, if it happened anywhere, whether it was in the United States or someplace else, it really would be a global catastrophe because there'd be reverberating economic impacts. It would have a huge effect on the foreign policy of whatever country had been attacked. I mean, if you think US foreign policy has been violent and brutal since 9-11, wait till you see what happens after a city goes up in smoke. Um, um, so uh, I would argue that even a small probability is enough to justify action to reduce the risk. So nobody would operate a nuclear power plant upwind of a major city if it had a one in a hundred chance of blowing sky high every year. Every, everybody would understand that was too high uh, a risk, um, or even a one in a thousand chance of blowing sky high every year. Uh, but I think we may be sort of in that one in a thousand per year zone uh, for uh, this kind of thing. So another possibility is uh, sabotage, as I mentioned. Um, so this is the area contaminated in the Fukushima accident. Uh, could have been a lot more. Uh, it turns out at unit four, which where the fuel did not catch fire, uh, it turns out that one of the key reasons for that is that water accidentally sloshed into the pool. Um, uh, and if the fuel in Unit 4 had caught fire, we probably would have had to evacuate Tokyo. So think about Japan without Tokyo. That's like very hard to imagine. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we got to make sure spent fuel pools aren't arranged so that they could cause a spent fuel fire. Uh, there are actually ways to do that, technically, that, that aren't very challenging. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, and have good security for nuclear reactors and uh, relevant facilities. 
The other possibility is the dirty bomb. Uh, this is uh, a study from some years ago of relatively uh, modest amount of cesium that you might find in a blood radiator in a hospital. Um, you know, down the street from us at Mount Auburn Hospital, they probably have some nice uh, dangerous uh, radiological sources, but they're, you know, they're important and valuable items for civilian uses. But if used by terrorists, they could pose a problem. And often they have very limited security. You know, in a hospital, you're not going to have a lot of guys with armed guards, you know, guarding this kind of thing. You have a sign that says danger, radioactive, which from a terrorist point of view says steal me. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so. But there is a bunch we can do to make the radiological sources uh, tougher to steal, um, also replace them with other things that are only radioactive when you flick a switch, uh, as opposed to radioactive all the time. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, terrorists have repeatedly considered doing that, although they haven't launched such an attack uh, yet. Insider threats are the most dangerous problem. Scott Sagan of Stanford and I have a new book uh, on that topic. Um, the noon thefts of highly enriched uranium to plutonium, the subset where we knew how, know how it happened, pretty much all done by or with the help of insiders. Also, the known sabotages, the subset where we know how it happened, were pretty much done by insiders. And there's, it, there's a lot of problems with insiders because you know, they already have the ac authorized access to get in through your security system. They're known to the other people. The other people are used to them being around. And, and you often sort of don't think to question that strange thing that the guy down the hall is doing. Um, and the most amazing thing to me in doing this project was the scale of the red flags that people, that organizations are prepared to ignore. So the guy who almost certainly committed the anthrax attacks in 2001, Bruce Ivins, sent an email to his staff complaining that his own paranoia was getting worse and worse and speculating about ending up in the newspaper with a headline of mad scientist in control of deadly germs and nobody reported that. Um, so just to give you an idea of reality, um, this is a little over a decade ago uh, at the Pelandaba site in South Africa, hundreds of kilograms of highly enriched uranium left over from their nuclear weapons program, which they were the only country that has ever gone for complete nuclear disarmament of a nuclear program that they had built and owned themselves. So an attack by two teams of uh, well-armed and well-trained people. Uh, one of them penetrated through the security fence, disabled the intrusion detectors, went to the emergency control center, which turns out to be the place where all the other alarms are routed. Uh, and they were, the person who was supposed to be on duty at that time was a quadriplegic in a wheelchair, but uh, he had gotten drunk at a party early, earlier in the day, and so somebody else uh, had substituted for him, and one of the people who was there, uh, who actually wasn't supposed to be there because he was just the boyfriend of the people, the person who had substituted for him, was a big rugby player, and so he got into a tussle with the intruders. They shot him in the chest, but he managed to raise the alarm, uh, and they spent about 45 minutes inside the guarded perimeter uh, without ever being engaged by the site security forces and left through the same hole in the fence that they cut before. Um, and there are pretty strong indications of insider help in that case. Uh, I spoke to the, the, the security manager, as you might guess, was fired. I spoke to the guy who replaced him. He said, yeah, I'm convinced it was insiders. And for all I know, I may still have them on my staff. Um, Sorry, what did they steal? Uh, they didn't steal anything to speak of. They did steal a laptop. laptop yes. but, um, yeah. I think it was only one laptop, was it, or was it two? Uh, and, you know, so the South Africans say, oh, they were just stealing a laptop. Excuse me, you don't come through it and has an old security fence to steal a laptop. <laughs> um, uh, I think, actually, that um, Heinz and Gerber raising the alarm and getting shot may have cut short whatever the actual conspiracy was intended to be. Uh, but since then, they've done a lot of security upgrades, um, but it is still a difficult threat environment. So. There are things that are making the risk better. Um, Corey will talk about how uh, we've been improving the security for all of these things. Um, core Al-Qaeda has been dramatically degraded. Uh, there's hardly any attacks around the world that were actually directed by core Al-Qaeda uh, in recent years. ISIS has been 
sub substantially degraded. Uh, there's still a lot of ISIS left in other places. Whoops. Um, India and Pakistan have an un they have the world's fastest growing nuclear stockpiles in countries with some of the world's most capable terrorists. Um, we have a sort of global spread of fairly committed jihadists. Although, you know, for the nuclear is a complex plot, right? You know, the kind of guy who drives a truck through a crowd is not going to be able to do anything interesting in the nuclear space. You need a you need a focused organization able to manage projects over extended periods of time with money, with ability to recruit experts and so on to have any hope in the in the nuclear space, which is why ISIS was sort of particularly scary because they were able to organize projects over extended periods of time. They had you know, manufacturing of conventional weapons that had very precise manufacturing tolerances and, you know, sort of rules and recruitment approaches and, you know, et cetera. That they, they had created a bureaucracy, uh, basically, that was able to do so. Uh, North Korea is still producing more and more nuclear material, and you could at least imagine that for the right price they might sell. I personally am not as worried about conscious state decisions to transfer. Uh, because of the potential consequences for that state. You know, the terrorists might use it in a way that would provoke retaliation that would remove you from power forever. And if your one goal is staying in power, that's kind of uh, a problem. Uh, but I could easily imagine, you know, a general in charge of some aspect of North Korea's nuclear program. Once there's enough of it that you feel like you could squirrel some away without anybody noticing and you know, you're thinking the regime is looking a little vulnerable and you want a golden parachute for yourself and your family, I could easily imagine that being a problem. That problem gets worse and worse as they produce more material. Um, the U.S. and Russia used to cooperate extensively. They have the world's largest stocks. Uh, that cooperation is completely cut off, and in fact, pretty much all cooperation between our nuclear enterprises is cut off so that you know, the, the, the world's largest nuclear establishments are literally not talking to each other anymore. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some modest spread of nuclear power. The, the sort of ideas of a nuclear renaissance are, are way exaggerated. Um, and that's, it, you know, if there are more nuclear power plants in more places, there are more places to sabotage. doesn't really increase the nuclear bomb risk because they, they run on material that can't be used in a nuclear bomb. So but, again, why doesn't it do that? Uh, because the... Fresh fuel is low enriched uranium, which can't support an explosive nuclear chain reaction. You need high enriched uranium. And the spent fuel does have some plutonium in it, but it's 1% by weight in these huge, radioact very radioactive fuel assemblies. It would be really hard to steal. <coughs> so from a terrorism point of view, the problem with spent fuel is sabotage, not theft and reprocessing and so on. But you could use a like, shoulder-propelled grenade or something to... Right, so it's a power plant. Right, right, right. Uh, both outsider and insider sabotage are. So a, a couple of points uh, on when you get stories about you know somebody sees some uranium or what have you. So first of all, not all uranium is interesting, right? The vast majority of uranium in the world is natural uranium, low enriched uranium, depleted uranium totally useless for nuclear weapons, and not even interesting for a dirty bomb, because uranium is actually not that radioactive. If you sprinkled uranium on your cornflakes and had it for breakfast, it would be a very bad idea. But it would mostly be a bad idea for the heavy metal toxicity more than the radioactive toxicity. Whoa. Um, secondly, H2 and plutonium doesn't have to be weapon grade, as the United States defines it, to be usable in a nuclear bomb. So the Hiroshima bomb was not actually weapon grade material. So I would just stay away from the phrase weapon grade. Uh, I often use weapons usable to refer to material that could be used uh, in a nuclear bomb. Uh, thirdly, terrorists make statements all the time, right? And they actually use statements about nuclear weapons to try to scare people. So just because some terrorist group has some guy who says, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a nuclear bomb, it doesn't necessarily mean everything. Um, don't, you know, you, you can get a lot of briefings about, you know, where you can go out and see, you know, these radiation detectors at borders and stuff. Those are not trivial, but 
you know, there's a lot of ways to get stuff through borders. We've got a lot of, you know, smuggled migrants going into different countries. We've got a lot of smuggled drugs going into different countries. Remember, we're talking about an amount of nuclear material like this in the case of plutonium, or like this in the case of highly mixed uranium. Uh, then the police, their early statements are often wrong. So the police have, in most countries, no nuclear knowledge or experience. And they have every incentive to exaggerate the importance of what they have just accomplished. Uh, so, big grain of salt on uh, those first reports. And then, you know, bring in an expert if you've got a, uh, if you've got a story. Okay. All right, I will apologize for going on too long and turn it over to Corey.